I want to tell you about the best advice I ever received in my life. I got this advice from a 14-year-old eighth grader. Now, at the time, I was also 14, also in eighth grade. This was my middle school classmate, eighth grade classmate, a guy named Brandon. Now, at the time, we were coming back from our eighth grade graduation trip. We had went to this place called Dorney Park, right outside of Philadelphia, because I'm from Philly. We got any Philly, Philly in the house here? A couple people? Okay. We were coming back from this place called Dorney Park, outside of Philly, and we're on the school bus going back to school, and I asked Brandon for some advice, because at this point, Brandon was the best basketball player in our middle school. And I played basketball, but I was far from the best. I wasn't even that good. I just started playing. So I asked Brandon for some advice. I said, Brandon, what do I need to do to get better? If I want to move on and play in high school and maybe play after that, what do I need to do? Because Brandon was so good, he was going to go play four years of varsity at one school. I was going to a different school, and I wanted to play on the team, but I wasn't even sure I was going to make it. So Brandon offered me two pieces of advice. He said, Dre, number one, you have to stop playing scared. You can't play basketball scared. And number two, you need to buy a game. Now, don't play scared the part I got, but buy a game, I never heard that before. I, I realized that was just a euphemism for get some skills. <laughs> so I took those two pieces of advice from Brandon, combined that with the next 10 to 20 years of my own experience, thoughts, and all of that, and I put it together in this whole framework called Work On Your Game. And that's what I'm here to talk about here today. So a framework brand business called Work On Your Game. And my task here today is to show you all how the tools and the strategies to help athletes get to the top 1% in sports can help you get to the top 1% of what you do. And I'm going to share four principles that will help you do that. Does that sound good? Yeah. Great. So let's get right to it. First principle, any of you, we got any sports fans in the room? OK, great. All right, so we all know that Tom Brady retired a few weeks ago, right? For good this time, all right? And you all probably remember when Kobe Bryant retired a few years ago, a few years back, and he wrote a little letter to basketball about how he was, how he was done. A lot of times people would ask me when I stopped playing ball, or any athlete when they stopped playing, or any of you know any athlete who stops playing, you ask them, why did you stop playing your sport? There are only three reasons why an athlete stops playing their sport. And let me tell you what one of the reasons is not. It is not because they get tired of the games. No athlete gets tired of going to a venue where a whole bunch of people pay money to come watch you play literally a kid's game, and you get paid money to do it. <laughs> Nobody gets tired of that. Nobody retires from that. Only three reasons why an athlete stops playing. Reason number one is physical incapability. Either it's an injury, your body just breaks down, you simply can't do it anymore. This is what Kobe referred to when he stopped playing. He said, my mind wants to keep doing it, but I can't put my body through this anymore. That's it. That's reason number one. Reason number two is lack of opportunity. So if you're playing a team sport, that means no team wants to sign you. You know, it's this funny thing. This is an athlete who used to play in the NBA, and he had wrote this article, and he said, or he's doing an interview, and he said, oftentimes an athlete in a team sport you are the last one to realize that your career is over. <laughs> Y'all get that one on the way home. <laughs> so in a team sport, is nobody wants to sign you. You can't get an opportunity. In an individual sport, a lot of people don't know this, but tennis players, golfers, bowlers, they have to pay their own expenses. So there's no team paying for those flights, those trainers, those meals, those hotels. So when it stops making sense financially, maybe they just have to stop playing. That's reason number two. Reason number three is the first principle that I want to share here today. And reason number three is everything other than the stuff you see athletes doing on TV. And that principle is called the third day. The third day. So what is it? I'll give you an example that will probably, you'll probably be able to refer, you'll be able to relate to really well. How many people in this room, you don't have to self-identify if you don't want to, but let's just say over the last six months, you've taken a little bit of a break or hiatus from going to the gym, exercising. You don't have to raise your hands if you don't want to. Okay, so I saw a bunch of hands go up. All right. So if you've ever done this or if you're doing it right now, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen when you come back, or right, if you come back, you go back to the gym. 
day one, you're going to be really excited. It's going to feel great because nobody makes you go to the gym, right? You choose. This is voluntary. So it's a new day. It's a new you. You have some new workout gear from Lululemon. Is that how you say it? <laughs> All right. <laughs> you got some Nike workout sneakers that you finally get to pop the tags off of. You got a new personal trainer who you hired. You signed up for the 20-pack of training sessions. You signed up for a boot camp class. You're going to show up every time. This is a new you. This is a new one. I know you, you quit last time, but this is a new situation, right? That first day, that workout kicks your butt, right? Because you haven't worked out in a while. Your body is not ready for this. But it's a new thing. It has that newness to it. So the workout is tough, but you drag yourself home or drag yourself to the car, look at yourself in the mirror, in the car or in the bathroom, and you say to yourself, I'm doing this. Second day, a little bit tougher because you have all the fatigue from day one combined with the fact that your body is still not in game shape, as we say. The trainer knows this, so they push you even harder on that second day. And that workout is even tougher than the first one, but you make yourself through it. You make yourself get through it. And I mean, it's only the second day, so that work it, working out thing still has that new car smell. You get what I'm saying? Drag yourself home or to the car. You look at yourself in the mirror, just a little bit less enthusiasm than you had on day one, and you say, I'm doing this. By the third day, already, things changed. Now, there was that motivational blog post that you read several months ago that said, put your workout sneakers next to the bed so you don't have to make a decision about putting them on when you wake up in the morning so you can go to the gym. Those sneakers feel like they're made of cement on that third day. There was this former NFL player. He played on the offensive line, and he said, after he retired, whenever he gets out of bed, it sounds like he's making microwave popcorn. <laughs> All right? That's what your body sounds like on the third day. On the third day, your body and mind are having a difference of opinion. The third day is that day when you roll over in bed, you grab your phone, and you send a text message to your trainer. You say, hey, just charge me for the session. I'm not coming in. <laughs> so what is the third day? Third day is any situation in the gym, in sports, at work, in anything that you do where the newness has worn off, the novelty of the situation is completely gone, and you realize that this thing that I signed up for, this job, this career, uh, this child, this relationship, this business, this sport, you realize that this is not all fun and games. There's some actual work that goes into this. And at that moment, because, you see, the third day is not the occurrence. It's not the realization that this is the situation. The third day is the decision that you make about what you're going to do from that point moving forward. Are you going to continue to show up as the professional that you have signed yourself up to be, or are you not? I remember I was watching this Mike Tyson biopic. Everybody knows who Mike Tyson is, right? Okay. Now, Mike Tyson, when he was first coming up boxing in heavyweights, he was just mowing everybody down. Any of you who's old enough to remember, you remember in the late 80s, early 90s, Mike Tyson was like the dominant athlete. Closest person to him at that level of dominance, maybe Michael Phelps, maybe Tiger Woods, nobody else. Mike Tyson was dominant. He was beating everybody, knocking guys out in the first round. Everybody's like, wow, Mike Tyson, this guy's amazing. He finally is going to get his chance to fight for the heavyweight championship belt. Now, Mike Tyson came from the streets of uh, Brownsville, New York, and he got discovered and mentored by this old Italian guy named Cus D'Amato. Now, Cus was way older than Mike Tyson, and he was in really bad physical shape by the time Mike finally got to his chance to fight for the title. So Mike is going, doing his training every day in the gym, and every day, as soon as he got out of the gym, he would go to the hospital to visit his mentor, because this is the guy who got him out of the streets, taught him how to box, saw the talent in him, and gave him an opportunity. So Mike's visiting Cuss every day in the hospital, like, man, are you going to be able to come to my fight? Will you even be able to see me fight? You're the reason that I have this chance. I need you to be there. And he could tell that Cuss was not going to be able to make it to the fight. So one day, Mike is sitting bedside with Cuss, as he did every day. He said to him, he said, Cuss, you're the reason that I'm not in the streets anymore. You're the reason that I'm not dead or in jail. You're the only reason I'm a boxer. I'm finally getting my biggest opportunity as a boxer. If you can't come and watch me do it, I'm not fighting. And Cuss was very weak at this point, and 
he called Mike close to him. He called him Michael. He called him real close so he could hear him. And he said, Michael, do you know what a professional is? And Mike Tyson answered really quickly. He said, yeah, of course, Cuss. A professional is a person who gets paid to, and Cuss cut him off. He said, no, Michael. It has nothing to do with money. A professional is a person who shows up and performs every single time, regardless of what they're feeling. Thank you for watching this highlight video from the Sandler Summit. You can join us for the next Sandler Summit in 2024, March 19th and 20th at the Orlando World Center Marriott. Register now at sandler.com summit.